All right, and we are back. We are the Coalition Loud and Proud, Outrage Porn Free, Civilly Disobedient Media, broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center. Now, forgive me when I come on to these segments, because very often what we'll do is we'll share them to Facebook groups for people who might be interested in picking up, who might not know about the show and would not normally go to the Go Local Live Broadcast Center. Um, there's someone I want to introduce you to. If you haven't heard from her before, uh, shame on you, because she's been a potent voice in favor of the medical cannabis program here in the state well, for years, uh, several very tumultuous years, be particularly beginning in the last few years. Um, she has been involved in it organically in its early years as a patient, as an advocate, and most importantly, as a moral voice which reaches out beyond the community that has so been so well served by this program and into the body politic. I had the opportunity to hear her for the first time in person oh, about, I guess it was about two years or so ago, when the last time Governor Raimondo tried to put an onerous tax on medical cannabis programs. If you're not familiar with our medical cannabis program, we were amongst the first states in the nation to legalize the production and distribution of cannabis targeted directly at the patient community here in the Rhode Island area. Folks who are very often in late stage cancers have neuromuscular diseases and a variety of afflictions who quite frankly have found peace, solace and a great deal of comfort in the ability A to purchase cannabis in a safe dignified manner in, an, in a production methods that have been that are well vetted the emphasis being safe particularly in the last few years as we've read about all the different ways that cannabis has well a variety of drugs can be adulterated it's a program that in its own way has worked wonderfully well my first if you will contact with the community was just a few years ago when Governor Raimondo decided to attempt to tax us. At the time she was talking about a program involving tags, thousands of dollars a year in cost, and a very restrictive distribution system. Fortunately, most of that, not all of that, was beaten back. This is, for a lot of folks, quite frankly, provides them much more than, as was originally attributed, a way to generate appetite. There's pain relief, in environments where we are working as a society to actively replace opioids. But it's expensive. It's not covered by medical insurance. It is now taxed to some degree. And distribution is strictly limited to folks who have been ordained by the state as being those who are allowed to distribute it at profit to the state. I know of no other place where medicine is taxed I know of no place where the government seeks to profit from the misfortune of a few. But most importantly, I know of no other place that I've been to in my life where I've met people like our guest who have been true warriors overlooking great personal challenges, having the strength of character, the integrity, and quite frankly, just the gumption to, despite their own personal challenges, routinely advocate on behalf of those less fortunate than them. What's equally astonishing is that all of this, every last bit of it, is really being caused by your state government. And that's the part I have so much difficulty in dealing with. I'll never forget a, uh, an afternoon a couple years ago, a day very much like today. Uh, Joanne Lepinen, RIPAC, who is just does amazing things on behalf of the patient community here in Rhode Island, gave me the, the blessing, if you will, of giving me a minute or two to, to speak to the folks. A couple hundred people out in a day like today, some of them very, very ill, brought together to fight for one of the few devices left to them to give them quality of life. And after two and a half hours of the state poobahs and toning on and on and on again about all the market efficiencies that can be gained by channeling it through this new system and how the cash would be used to benefit the patients, 
never once mentioning the word actually patient. And it wasn't until people like Ellen Smith got, came, came up, testified, and in her own dignified way, gave them hell. Fortunately, most of this was beaten back. Now we face ourselves, with the budget being announced today, of all sets of new costs and restrictions. And I just have to wonder, at what point, and this is my thoughts, not my guess. I never want to project my thoughts on my guess. Usually they're much more articulate and more dignified than I am. At what point in time does an amoral Rhode Island government, who clearly lacks any sense of soul whatsoever, simply leave these folks alone to continue their lives in quiet dignity and to use all of their powers to face whatever physical challenges have been placed upon them. I just have to wonder. So on that note, I introduce you to Ellen Smith. Ellen, thank you for coming on tonight on short notice, and thank you for joining the oh, coalition. Of um, if you would, tell us about your own history with the program. What, um, what brought you to the program, both as a patient and an advocate and an activist? Absolutely. Um, I'm 68 now, and back in 2007, I was heading out to Wisconsin for one of my medical surgeries. I have two incurable conditions that are both rare, and with, um, I was having a horrible time with medication from birth on. Finally had DNA testing to prove that I really can't even take an aspirin, a Tylenol, any of the opiates, um, Benadryl, you name it. I just am so drug reactive. And here I was still teaching back in 2007, um, horrible brain fog, horrible pain, and knew I was losing my career, was about to head out to Wisconsin, and went to my doctor and said, you know, if the surgery doesn't work, I'm going to need help because I'm not sleeping at all. I can't think straight. I need help. And he said, we're not going to wait. He sent me to the pain clinic doctor in Rhode Island who looked at my records and, and <laughs> basically, you know, back at that time, there were no dispensaries. He basically suggested I get a sample, I try cannabis, and see if this could be my answer. And I sat there and laughed and thought, I don't want to spend my life being a stone. This guy's nuts. And kind of laughed at him and told him my parents would be rolling in the grave listening to this conversation. But I was desperate. I came home and got all the product and converted it immediately after speaking to my pulmonologist into an oil form because I, if I smoke anything, it would be fatal. Um, so I took a teaspoon of oil that night, warned my husband that I'd taken it. Um, I tried can cannabis recreationally in college once, and I did not react well at all. I spent the rest of the day in bed feeling like I was going in and out of sodium pentothal, and I hated the feeling. So the thought of that would be my future of living on this, I thought, what kind of life is this going to be? Maybe I'm better off in pain. But I took the advice and took this teaspoon of oil that night and mixed it with a little applesauce and and was scared to death, went to bed. The next thing I know, it was morning. It was the first time in years I literally had slept the entire night. And it doesn't matter what you have wrong with you. If you do not get rest, there's no way you're going to move forward. So this has literally been my lifeline for me ever since. And, you know, I came into the program when there was nothing. There was no dispensary. There was nowhere to turn. And the choice was either go on the black market or go ahead and, and learn how to grow yourself. So that we took our retirement money. I did have to retire from my career. Uh, took my retirement money and, and said the medical grow. I had no idea what we were doing. Made a lot of you know mistakes in the out and in time became more confident. And when the compassion centers were legally allowed to open, and I believe it was Governor Chafee at that time was afraid of having government raids and still wouldn't open them. That's when my husband and I decided we couldn't stand watching people uh, not having access to medication that was safe. So we became caregivers, both of us at that time, because back then it was allowed to be that and not be considered a co-op. So at one point we literally had five patients each that we grew for to give them safe access to affordable, you know, clean medication. So that's, you know, we just really felt that we had to speak up. If I was scared to death in my 60s to do this, then I would think anybody else was probably feeling like me. So we've done nothing but continue to advocate since then. Sorry about the dog that's barking in the background. Um, have ad advocated since then. And, and it just kind of, it, we dreaded every year to look at the State of the Union address and hear what the next, next battle is going to be. And we've all known 
that recreation was going to be coming along. And we've all known when it came that we were going to have to fight to maintain the integrity of the medical program. And it would make sense that with the medical program coming in, that this would be the time to cut us a break. Don't charge us for all these registration fees and tags and, and, and you know, certificates. And, oh, it's just, it's, it's so out of control now. Why are they trying to make money on us? I can't go to the pharmacy. This is the only thing I can take to keep myself alive and give any quality of to my life, but yet I don't get reimbursed for anything. So the thought that, you know, you're going to keep charging me and maybe even more and make more restrictions, it's just out of control. So the battle's back, and we're going to be back at the state house as soon as those bills are up for, you know, testifying. We're going to continue on and keep doing this until we can get this program as clean as we can. Does that tell a little bit of the story? No, no, this is, this is, you know, there's an institutional knowledge that certain people have in this state um, that needs to be maintained and retold. Because ultimately, there are so many urban legends surrounding the program, so many myths, truths, some of them perpetrated by the government itself, uh, that, that this is your, your, your critical voice. Um, if you could define the active ingredients in how you participate in medical cannabis as opposed to the stereotypical picture of someone sitting around, for lack of a better term, smoking weed. Active ingredients mean how do I take it? Yeah. What you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I actually take three higher CBD indica nighttime plants, mm -hmm. uh, grind up the product, mix it, mix it together, and make myself a nighttime oil. Mm -hmm. um, What's amazing to me, and I'm still shocked to this day, and that's why I couldn't keep my mouth shut, something so simple and so clean and natural, uh, that teaspoon of oil literally carries me through the night with sleep. I wake up not groggy, not high, the sensation that people are just assuming, and I, the entire next day, with two incurable painful conditions, do not need to take any medication. That calming in my body from the nighttime medication continues into the next day. So right now, I've had nothing since last night, and <laughs> which is amazing because I walk around with a body that subluxes consistently and things that slip out of place, and you know, I have Ellery's balance, which is, can be pretty darn painful and, and discouraging, and I've had 24 surgeries, spent four years in a wheelchair, but yet this teaspoon of oil is my lifeline. So, you know, I originally made my oil from a regular uh, indica plant, and then I've switched now to a little higher CBD, because the more I learn about CBD, there's, you know, nothing but wonderful value in that, too. But um, I'm finding a lot of people in society right now are, fri are afraid of THC because of the big, uh, big talk about CBD from the hemp plant, that they, they end up being afraid of THC in a cannabis plant, which is a shame, because if you're living with pain, most of us need that THC combined in that to help relieve the pain. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. You know, if you take with any medication, as long as you take a correct dose for your body and don't overdo it, then you're not going to get high in stone. If you take too much, then yeah, that can happen to anybody. It's no different than taking any of any other medication appropriately. So you do have to, you know, take the dose appropriately and take it slowly and build up to the level that's correct for you. But I never had once ever since 2007 starting cannabis something that i didn't think i'd ever touch in my life again have i never once had a desire to ever have to have my medication it doesn't work that way i don't have this 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 craving and this you know <laughs> these people just assume that if you're using that you must be taking more and more because your body just desires more i actually decreased when things got a little better from some of my surgeries from at one point i was at four teaspoons to sleep I'm now maintained at one teaspoon, and that's enough, and that's all I need, and that carries me through the entire next day. So it's pretty magical. Did I answer your question okay? No, absolutely. This is wonderful. This is exactly okay. what people need to understand. Okay. Now, in the earliest days of the program, there was a very effective distribution system. There's, there's the concept of a caregiver. Uh, there were growers. There were compassion centers. And, of course, there were patients. Today's budget proposal... And we've been telegraphed this a couple of days ago. But today's budget proposal seeks to eliminate the personal grow. Um, how Im That's impactful in a number of ways, I would imagine, both 
economic, but also psychological. How important is the personal grow and the role of the caregiver to the entire program? A personal grow for any of us that do it, it, it is part of my life. It's part of the calming of my body, to be hmm. honest with you. To go downstairs, to watch nature, to watch the seeds sprout, to watch a, you know, a, a clone root, to watch the plant grow, to see this grow into a bud, to know that this is my lifeline, this is the medication that's keeping me alive. This whole process is very calming and, and very helpful to my body and for my life. So to even think about taking that away is horribly emotionally upsetting. And on top of that, as I stated, we use my retirement money um, to set up this medical grow. When I started in 2007, there was no other place to get medication unless I went to the black market, and then I wouldn't even know what I was getting. Right. I can grow safe, clean medication. Right now in this state, even from the compassion centers, there's no for, for third-party uh, testing of medication. I know what, I, what my plants are, are being treated with. I know what soils it is. I know what nutrients are going on to it. So I know mine is safe. Um, I am so reactive. The thought of going and having to come up with money, which would cost me more than the grow, to be honest with you, it would be a, a lot more money to be able to have to go to a center. And on top of that, I go to a center, are they going to be able to give me those grains that are compatible to my body? And when I've spoken about my condition at a national conference, I explained to all this room of people learning about cannabis, you know, even though we all have the same condition, it does not mean what works for me is going to work for them in terms of the strains. We all have to find what, what is the correct, you know, strain for our personal body. Right. So that takes some time for people. And to the thought that you could go there and let's say that particular strain didn't happen to harvest yet or it got sold to a recreational user, I mean, it sounds like a no big deal to somebody else will just get something else. Well, that's something else for a medical patient may not be their match. So right. it's a very frightening feeling that this all could be taken away um, for a number of reasons for us. Now, people also talk about the role of the caregiver. Um, mm -hmm. you, uh, you, you had mentioned you and your husband have been caregivers to up to five different people. Uh, why, would, right. why, why would a prospective patient need a caregiver? What, what role does the caregiver play? A lot of different reasons. I've had patients that wanted to be very private. They did not want to walk into a public building so people would identify them. Um, for instance, maybe somebody who's a teacher. Um, I've had people who um, like the oil that I happen to create that they can't get in another center. Uh, I've had, uh, you know, it's just all different reasons. Let me see, my mind's a little blank. Now you're going to be late at night for me. Uh, let me see what are the other reasons. Uh, financially, we are able to keep the price down. Um, we only charge for the cost of the soil, the electricity, and the nutrients we put on the plants, so we don't try to make money off the people as much as help to pay for some of our electricity, so we, we are able to keep the prices down. Um, they appreciate that they know that I'm growing those plants specifically for them, so they don't have to worry about a loss of a strain which can happen when you go to the center, and I'm not trying to put the centers down, but that's the reality. No, no, I understand. That, yeah. You know, somebody else gets in line before you, and that was the last of that product, and there it goes. You know, you're stuck. Whereas we, we grow for our patients. They know that we're going to be able to provide for them what they need. Um, and, 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 and a lot of them really, I, I can't tell you for many, many years how many doctors would actually send people to the house for a one-to-one -one kind of a consult just to help them break through the ice like I needed to, to understand not to be scared of this. The society's made us scared, and we shouldn't be scared. This is a wonderful product, and it's, it's going to help to turn your life away from many, many people. We've watched them go off other medications, including their opiates, because they're able to wean off of that, which is wonderful, too. So it's, it's a very, um, to be a caregiver, and I am my patient, too, it's a very wonderful experience and probably one of the most meaningful things I've ever done in my life, to be honest with you, to watch somebody come into this house in a wheelchair, stressed, looking horrible, and then talking to them the next morning, calling up and saying, I can't believe it, you're right, I just slept. You know, people don't understand what it's like to live life with no sleep. I mean, it's horrible. You know, like I said, it doesn't matter what you have wrong. If you don't get sleep, you don't think straight. You, you can't function. You can't move forward. 
So it's, it's a very uh, wonderful experience. And, you know, it helps you when you're living with something, you've lost your career, you lost, you know, initially you lose your purpose and meaning in life, and you have to kind of rebuild yourself. And to feel that you can reach out and help somebody else in this manner makes me feel like I, I have a purpose again. So I'm, I'm very grateful to the state that they've allowed this to happen. It's unfortunate when it was a number of years ago that they changed the ruling, and if two people in one household were caregivers, you became a co-op, and they're really going to charge you. We couldn't afford to do that, so we, my husband had to drop his five patients, and it was heartbreaking. And we, you know, <laughs> we're trying to follow the rules, but the rules get a little ridiculous, and it ends up hurting good people, good patients that are just like me, just trying to go on and live their life with whatever they've been given. Now this okay? is, <laughs> now this is clearly a calling for you. Um, this is not a, a you know, and and and. and Understated is the importance of uh, your skilled hands, and not only your your you know your your, your psychological support and the, and the way that you I've seen you embrace people, but the um, this is not an easily this isn't your neighbor's tomatoes are they This is not squash which everyone by the end of the <laughs> summer is looking to give away. This is it, it takes skill and a farmer's patience and and a farmer's uh, science to grow this product. Correct? Correct. Correct. We put a lot of time and energy into learning how to do what we're doing. And it, it, and it took us a number of years, like I said. It wasn't until the governor wouldn't let those compassion centers open, and we kept meeting more and more people coming to the house being sent by doctors to learn about using it, and then where were they supposed to turn? Right. And that was just heartbreaking. So that's when we finally got our confidence to break down and try to be caregivers and help other people and have had no regrets. Our only regret is that we're not going to, we're not going to pay the money to be considered a co-op. That's insane. I mean, we are home growers. We've never abused the law. We're right here just trying to help people out and to suddenly have to call us a co-op because we both live in the same house. It's just, you know, that was ridiculous. And we, we just had to let the people go and it was horrible. And it shouldn't have been. I mean, I listened to the governor's speech in the State of the Union the other day, and I remember the line about we need to protect our elderly and the most vulnerable. Then what are we doing? <laughs> right. I, I'm one of those people. What are we doing? This is not going to protect us. This is going to tear us apart in the name of what? Making money off us again? I mean, this is not this is not how we should be doing things. We're not trying to make money off of people that have hardship. That's not the way it should be. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 I'm not a participant in the program. Uh, my, somehow my family has been spared some of the challenges that the folks that I've met through my, you know, peripheral involvement have. And so at the same time, what you're saying is so straightforward and compelling. I, I, it's, it's unimaginable to me. Now, the, the government, it seems like, just seems hell bent on what I'll call death by a thousand paper cuts. Some of some of the challenges that you've had to meet from the government, and I would wonder if you could address some of them, why they're so important. Um, a number of towns, and I we we run a regular or semi regular segment here on the coalition called Town Councils Gone Wild. Uh, you've got town councils who've decided that they're going to create their own medical cannabis law, and seemingly always on the list is a database of people who grow. Why is it important, why is it critical that you be allowed your privacy in, in how, you, how and when you decide to grow? And that's one of the reasons we chose not to be labeled as a cop, because we would have to register and, and give our name out, and that's not acceptable. I mean, I don't want to be a target. I do not want to be a target. So we keep this private. Of course, you know, I'm not exactly private being an advocate, but, uh, you know, we, we don't go around announcing to the world, you know, all about this. And I think people should, this is privacy. I mean, you don't, I don't know who goes to the store and buys Oxycontin or buys morphine or, you know, buys an antibiotic. I mean, that's somebody's private, personal medical life, and, and that's not something that should be out there. Um, so I think that's really wrong um, and inappropriate that we've always worked to strive to keep it that this is a privacy issue and a HIPAA law should be involved in this. It doesn't make any sense to me. So that is, and thank you for bringing it up, that is another reason we chose not to continue on being caregivers for both of us um, and have
having to go to the, I think it was going to have to go to the state police and register and this and that. So right. It's just, just out there. It's ridiculous. Right. Um, people don't go through that to go to a pharmacy. Why, why are we being raked over the cold um, to use this program medically? Um, I, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And the other thing I don't understand is why we have to keep waiting for specific qualifications to be announced and pr approved. There's, I believe it's the state of New York has a bill pending right now where it, they would just allow the doctor to decide if the patient should be using cannabis or right. trying it. And I thought, what a perfect solution. Because it's really, isn't that between the doctor and the patient? You know, why should the state decide who has the right? I happen to have a rare condition. And it's not listed. It's one state in the country has listed Ellis Demos for a qualifying condition. The only other people in this country that can qualify with my condition is if they include the wording of chronic pain. But Arkansas right now has a list of about 50 conditions, and guess what's not in there? Chronic pain. So me, in that state, would not be able to be a patient. So it doesn't even make sense. We need to, we need to equalize this across the country. All people should have the right, and it really makes the most sense to simply say with doctor's permission. Doctor is recommending this. I mean, different, you know, differently than a doctor recommending take the script, go to the pharmacy, and try this medication. So I, mean, I, I, I think that, to me, is the simplest solution in the end for this whole process. No, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, there's just si simply no question. And this at a time, and, and I can't stress this enough, at a time when this nation is embroiled in an opioid crisis, you've got a simple, natural, effective off-ramp for a significant number, and, and because of the Byzantine laws, we don't know how many people, you know, but a significant number of folks who are using pain amelioration through opioids and or heavy-duty heavy pharmaceuticals could seek the same relief at a significantly lower cost when government is taken out of it by in using medical cannabis. It, it's, it's really that simple, isn't it? Absolutely. In fact, the U.S. Pain Foundation has um, been collaborating with America for Safe Access for a couple of years now for an, a campaign of um, end pain, not lies, uh, encouraging oh. every state to look into the access of cannabis to replace, you know, or have it as, a, as an option for people who, are, you know, I mean, I think we also have to be real that there are people out there who have appropriately and successfully used their opiates, whether other people like it or not, and it's been okay for them, and all of a sudden the rug's been pulled out from under them like they're criminals and they're nasty, dirty people because they've been using an opiate. And that's wrong, too. I mean, who are we to judge what's working for somebody and what's right for their body? I just, right. you know, I don't think anybody should tell anybody else. What, what they should be using or not be using, and, and we're not living in their shoes. We don't know what their life is like, and if that was working, why are they not able to get their scripts filled anymore? And I'm not saying there isn't a serious opiate epidemic, but there's also the other angle, of those, just those people who were successfully using what was keeping their life moving forward and, you know, as best as they could, and this was what was compatible for them. And that, that's really sad, too. So, you know, it's nice that we have this as an option, Everybody in the country should have this as an option, and you know it, it, that's certainly something. Uh, working with America for Safe Access and the Pain Foundation, that we're we're working on trying to see it equally across the country that everybody has this as a choice. Cannabis as another option for opiates too. It's it's a wonderful solution and it's such a logical one. We need to get cannabis out of Schedule One. <laughs> we need to move forward. We need to allow. I mean, I can't tell you how many times. I'll hear doctors say, oh, no, I would never do that. This isn't being researched. There's no data. Well, duh. It's our own problem. There's no data. Exactly. That's a one-up with heroin. Like, what, what are we doing? You right. know, you can't have it both ways. So get it out of there. Let's get the stupid research. That's all over. I mean, Israel has tons of research on this. And there were two wonderful articles put out this week of research that was done showing the number of people in states that have cannabis that have been able to reduce and get off their opiates. So, like... It's a no-brainer what, what should be there for everybody, you know? Right. No, I, I, I agree with you. You know, it's, we fight very hard in a variety of forums and a variety of other issues to maintain the right to control one's body. Uh, and, in fact, this year, right. for the first time, a national right to try law was passed finally so that all states could em embrace 
new medicines for the terminally ill. The, uh, the notion that somehow in the year 2019, we are still discussing cannabis in, in the, type of, uh, the type of language that drills back to the early 20th century is astonishing given the societal costs that are involved and let's just be blunt, the simple humanity. I, I yeah. it's it's sta- I mean, it's staggering. How ridiculous. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, please. How ridiculous is it that you could go to a pharmacy way back in our country and purchase cannabis? It was for sale in our pharmacies, and then things got changed. Kids came along; they wanted to make rope out of. I mean, it's like, what have we done, and why have we put such fear in people's minds? And you know, and, and you. It's, that's why I couldn't be quiet about this. I, I understand people being concerned and thinking they're doing something wrong. And it's the most gentle on medication. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. It doesn't just take everything away. But when you are a person living with pain, this calms your body down and your life is so much better that I, I don't feel like I need to have to take something else during the day. And my body is calmer. And I am so appreciative of that. And I don't get me wrong, I'm so grateful to be in the state of Rhode Island that we've had the rights we've had. And it's sometimes a little annoying working on the website for, um, for the WIPAC Facebook page and people whining and complaining and, oh, I'm going to move out of here. I'm thinking, you better look at some of the other states and compare to what we have and what they don't have because right. we actually have had a really decent program that's getting chopped up, but we've had some good stuff here. And, you know, we just need to build it back up and keep it safe and keep our hands off of it. Leave people alone and let them get through whatever they've been given and make the best little life that they have left to live. You know? And I continue to be impressed by the, the strength, the sophistication, of, uh, the, uh, the maturity, if you will, of the people in your program who are sometimes facing the direst of circumstances. Um, and, and yet still manage to be able to go out and, and you know, and, 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 and work on these issues for people who simply physically can't or not, are simply not the type two. I, 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 want to, I want to talk about the economic cost here, too, because it, it, to me it's staggering that we would put, um, that we would people, put people who are, who are very ill in these positions. At one point in time, there was a very straightforward path to giving excess product, excess medicine, as, we like, as you like to say in the program, uh, to people. If you, if you are fortunate enough to grow, and, 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 and the key issue here is, again, harken back to earlier remarks, this is not, you know, like I said, going out and planting squash. This is not green, green and red peppers. This is not beefsteak tomatoes. This requires a patient hand with the talent, the money, the environment, the support system to grow, as you said, the various strains that are appropriate for various illnesses. So now, at one point in time, the ability to gift those people who were fortunate enough to have express production was fairly straightforward. What's the status of that now? Oh, the gifting? Yeah. <laughs> I believe that, you know, I'm, I'm so confused with all the changes. I, I'm going to sound really stupid right now. Um, I believe, you know, um, if somebody has a card, a medical card, you're allowed to donate to them. Um, and we've done that numerous times. There, it, just, it would break your heart, some of the stories of these people you meet. And I just, there's times we can't just gift it all away because it's costing us money. I mean, our electricity bill is $500 a month. Right. And that's why it's important that I have patients to help cover that because it's not cheap. But it's less than less money than if I had to go to a, a compassion center with not being guaranteed to get what I need. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so it's what I have to do. But um, when, when I was meaning gifting, I, mean, I, don't, I meant really the ability to easily transfer excess production to people who were running short, who had problems, who were new to the program. Because what what does it cost right now at a compassion center ballpark? What, what type of typical costs are we running into, in addition to the cards, the permitting, the, all the different hoops you have to jump through just to become part of the program? I mean, cost to buy it at this point? Yeah. I, I can't tell you right now because I haven't been there in ages, to be honest with you. Um, I can tell you what we sell ours for, and I know when people hear the price, it's 
a heck of a lot less than we sell for $150 for an ounce. Mm -hmm. We see people coming out of the compassion center with grants because they can't afford more than that. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I believe, that I, I don't want to misrepresent them because I'm not positive, but I know the prices have started to come down some. Um, but we should, I mean, it kills me when I hear about a raid and then wonder what happens to that. When there's people desperate for medication, where is that product going? Are they destroying it? Mm -hmm. Like, what's, what's going on? You know, I think, you know, the gifting program should be allowed. It's something that is very appropriate. There are people out there that are desperate. Um, you can't always hold everybody up, but those of us that grow can certainly, and we've always helped people out in any way we can. Um, you know, on top of trying to keep our bills going. Right. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if I'm getting tired. I don't know if I'm answering. No, no, you're, 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 this, this is wonderful. You're, 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 you're spot on. So, so now we face okay. a budgetary crisis that, again, targets, a, in the midst of, and, and I'm not here to argue, discuss, with, politicize this or discuss with you all the giveaways that the government wants to get involved in. Let's just say that we had a significant expansion of government and government proposed expenditures in this budget as proposed today. And yet, at the same time, and a program that, in terms of, of the amount of money involved, doesn't even occupy a decimal point on the state's budget, seems to be a constant, and, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hype up the, uh, the outrage here, but, but, but it's, it's confusing to me because every year, you alluded to it earlier, you folks go through this process where you open up the budget and you wait for the speech and okay, hold on folks, we're in for a bumpy ride. What, is there anything you can attribute to why they're obsessed with this program? I think it's, you know, we, we want to increase kindergarten, you know, pre-kindergarten, we want to offer, you know, education to college students for four years. I mean, all these things take money. We're reducing taxes to cars, so where's the money coming from? And, oh, there's the cannabis program. Let's go for that. I mean, to me, unless I'm being stupid, it seems like they're trying to make the money off of us. I don't understand it. I remember a couple of years ago when she talked about, uh, I think it was like $17,000 one plant was worth. Right. I was, I was there for that. About? And I... I invited Norman. We went to the state house, had a meeting, and I said, "Would you please come and see my medical grow, and please explain to me where you you're getting these facts from?" Because at that time, I wasn't the greatest grow in the world. We were getting, you know, an ounce and a half, maybe two, if we were really lucky, off a plant. And how was that plant worth seventeen thousand right. dollars? And I give him credit. He looked at our growth, spent a couple hours in the house, and listened and traveled and met other people in their grows, and lo and behold, the price started to come down, and they realized that that was really inappropriate. So I don't know where they're getting their information from, but, you know, we need to keep this in perspective, and it's really, really out of control, and I, I don't get it. I really do not get it. I totally forgot your question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. So, I, and it, so we've got a couple, just a couple minutes left, and, and again, uh, okay. I, I'm so grateful for you joining me tonight, and I, I know I will... See you at the state house, and well, how how can I, absolutely? Um, and because we'll be there as well. I'm in, in my other capacity. I'm chairman of the Libertarian Party of Rhode Island, and we are going to be like lasers on this. Uh, it's it's incomprehensible. This this is so outrageous on so many different. Just basic. Forget about the politics. Forget about the party labels. Forget about all of that on a basic human label level. This is just. Thoroughly outrageous. So now you're with Ripe. You're also you're with RIPAC and a couple of other organizations. How, how can folks reach out to you onto the web? And I, I'm sure you guys are going to do a great job of you know notifying people when there's going to be hearings. What what? How can people help? How can people help at your program? The best place to go at this point because we have absolutely no funding for RIPAC anymore. There's no funding, so we don't even have the money to keep the website going at this point. We're really drowning. So our best place of communication is on the RIPAC Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And on the top of the page, I put in my actual email address. So if anybody has a personal question, they can directly get in touch with me there. I post articles and information there. And absolutely, if there are bills coming up and we need people to testify, 
I will be sure to post it and let people know to come join us. Um, very important that people remember to be appropriately dressed and use appropriate language. If we get carried away and we don't abide by the time, time frame and we carry away and use vulgar language, it is such a turn off and that's kind of what they sometimes expect from us so we need to show the better side and remember why we're there and, and try to be as appropriate as we can to get our point across to them. We are real people trying to live our lives with dignity and better quality which this is providing. But don't take it away from us financially because I don't know why you're picking on us. <laughs> I don't know why you pick on the people that are already struggling to live. I mean, <laughs> I've had catatonic episodes. I've been in four years in a wheelchair. My life has been not easy, and I'm trying my best here. So why would you pick on me? You know, why would you try to make money off of me? I can't work anymore. I can't bring any more money in. I, you know, it just doesn't even make any sense to me why you target this segment of the population. You know? No, <laughs> I'm I... sorry. It's, just, it's, it's heartbreaking. No, no, it, it really, really is. Um, folks, first of all, they, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash RIPAC, R-I-P-A-C. Of course, that's the Rhode Island Patient Advisory Coalition. Um, and you can find all the information. I, I'm asking folks, and we're going to be circulating this, the video of this everywhere. I'm asking folks, again, forget about politics. Forget about your personal, or whatever urban legends you want to deal with with, with cannabis. Legalization of cannabis is a separate issue I feel equally strong on, but should not impact whatsoever the efficacy, the existence, and the primary goals of the medical cannabis in Rhode Island. Everyone who's ever been connected with it. And unfortunately, Alan, this is one of these programs where there's opposition until one day you wake up, sadly, and you find out that your father, your brother, your coworker, some guy you play softball with, a fraternity brother, Someone you, someone you grew up with is all of a sudden involved. And then it's not the patients. It's not the medical cannabis users. It's someone that you love and someone that you know. And you're terrified for them all right, because of the illnesses or challenges they face physically. And yet you so all of a sudden you see the simple human comfort that takes place through the application of a natural product that is exists and no harm to anyone else at a cost that approaches a affordable, approaches affordable, is a fraction of the weight placed on society by any one of the number of opioids or healthcare systems, and you wonder and you pray to the baby Jesus and you say, why can't this be available to everyone? Why can't this be easy? Why can't we just let people live lives of quiet dignity? And I, again, Ellen, I have, I have no answers, but I mean, but God bless you. And um, I want you to know there's a lot of Rhode Islanders that quiet minority who, um, well, I'll, I'll let you be the dignified voice. People like me are, you know, I'm ready to raise a little bit of hell on this. Well, thank you for caring to put this on the air and speak up for us. I, I appreciate it. There are so many people out there that don't have the capacity with their illnesses to be able to advocate. And it's not that they don't care, but, I mean, people in this program are not doing well. <laughs> and like you said, unfortunately, we've seen it happen time and again. People who were so against it, and all of a sudden something happens to them or somebody they care about medically, and all of a sudden, gee, next thing you know, they're pulling me aside, and I'll guess what I'm using now. <laughs> gee, that's funny. You were talking against me just a year ago. So, right. you know, I don't wish anybody ill will, but it's unfortunate that it's a slow process, and that's exactly what starts to change people is when they have somebody they care about and they see the change in them when they're able to get medication that works for them. Safely, you know. Well, so thank you. Now, Ellen Smith, truly are a warrior on so many different levels of human dignity, of human rights, someone who cares, someone who's a patient, someone who's an advocate. And again, facebook.com slash R-I-P-A-C. That's the Rhode Island Patient Advisory, I'm sorry, Advocacy Coalition. Um, it's disappointing to see about the website, but uh, folks, if you're looking for a worthy organization, to donate to, it's volunteer based. And again, you're talking about people like Ellen who just as an extension of their lives somehow find the energy and time to, to help people incredibly less fortunate than they are. Ellen, we'll be, we'll be in touch and uh, I, uh, I look forward to seeing you up in, uh, as we refer to it here, Halitosis Hall. 
I'll see you at the State House. I'm sure it's going to come soon. <laughs> thank I, you for caring. Well, thank you. It. And God bless okay. you. You take care. Bye-bye right. now. What do you say to something like that? Do you continue to immerse yourself in your own lives of quiet desperation and hope that it works out? Or do you get involved? Sometimes involving is just sending a small check. Sometimes involving is calling your state house representative and saying, enough. Somehow being involved may be as simple as reaching out to the church you go to and asking your pastor, minister, whomever, is there someone who's involved in this program in the church? And how can I quietly, on a confidential basis, help? But have no doubt, the last set of hearings that I went to a couple years ago, there was a highly organized attempt to sugarcoat the devastation of a program that helps so many by using the voices of the professional politician, the political class that exists in this state, who draws enormous salaries and enormous wealth and enormous power from a government that you've bequeathed them. So we've created this mess by letting government get involved and giving them an open playing field to, to immerse themselves in issues like this. The only people who can change it are us. Folks, we'll be right back. If you are listening to The Coalition, we are, in fact, outraged, porn, free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center in the heart of the city we love, Providence, Rhode Island. The naked city, the city of a thousand stories. We're anticipating some tough weather. So as our governor would say, hunker down. And if you're stuck at home and you've got the power on, God bless, and you're warm and cozy and you're you're healthy. Think of Ellen and the cause that she represents this weekend. Take a few times to leave a moment to leave a constructive, mature, professional voicemail. And talk about Ellen and talk about medical cannabis in the state. If we are silent, then they will simply move forward. It took a lot of outrage last time to fight this back. This governor is intent on blanketing this state with as many proposals as possible so that those of us who see simple dignity in a program like the medical cannabis movement are fighting a game of legislative whack-a-mole. Don't be that person. Folks, stay tuned. We're going to have some folks on for our weekly segment of Libertarian Fabulous. Joining us is a young man who's engaged with a rough Phillips 2020 campaign. And we're going to talk about the sex workers platform of the rough 2020 campaign. <laughs> 